who's just joining. We'll get started in a few minutes. What's your weather like, Emma? Today it's pretty neutral, I think. There's been some sun, some rain. Sometimes I'm warm, sometimes I'm cold. Yeah. We've got the air conditioning on at the moment. It's going to be pretty warm today. Yeah, ours is on too. We have a maximum of two Celsius today. <laughs> <laughs> so if I look cold, it, it, like even though the heat is still up, it's so. Uh... I believe Claire, that funeral at the up at the point was lovely. The, yeah, that's, that's what I heard. I, yeah, sometimes I see pictures, and I didn't see any pictures from uh, from that one. But um, but yeah, yeah. I heard that, um, that yeah, there were, uh, like as you can imagine, a lot of nice tributes and uh, huge. Yeah, my my daughter's cousin said it was huge. Uh -huh. I just had a good old laugh trying to get a, you know a bunch of flowers from one side of the right. world to the other. It happened. <laughs> Yeah, no, in the end, it was, um, it, yeah, it was very smooth. But, um, but yeah, so I, I looked up like broom florists and so on and couldn't find anything. And then Perth florists couldn't find anything. And then Amazon yeah. and said, so, yeah, it'll be there by March. But like, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And then, of course, it rained and the roads were out. And, but it's bitumized all through now. But then, you know, it's all settling. Uh -huh. um, I just can't believe it's all bitumized now, that road. Right. Yeah. It took, um, I think it took seven hours the first time I went there. Yeah. We started at 3 a.m. and I went, no, it must have been five. Yeah. We started at 3 a.m. and I was there by like 8 30. Uh, wow. Yeah. Times yeah, have changed. Then, right. Uh, yeah. And then the last time it was, there was just that one, that one strip. Um, but yeah, I heard that one. Yeah. That had been, had been done too. All right. Do you think we're good to get started? I think so. Okay, then welcome everyone. We are so happy to welcome Claire Ballard from Yale and Susan Hansen from Goldfields Aboriginal Language Centre and Denise Smith Alley from the Nunga Bujar uh, Language Culture Aboriginal Corporation to workshop two, which is revitalization at a distance, engaging digital archives for language reclamation. So I will turn it over to our presenters. Great. Thanks, Emma. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, here in uh, Quinnipiac country, Quiripi country in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and uh, uh, Denise and George and Sue are, um, uh, are in Australia. We thought we'd just start by introducing ourselves and then we'll tell you about the plan for the, uh, for the workshop. Um, and I have a uh, PowerPoint, which I need to just uh, set up quickly. Um, there we go, we'll go back to the screen share. How's, how's that looking? Good. Oh, excellent. Cool. So, um, yeah, so the plan for today is to start with introductions um, and then we're going to talk a bit about the um, this whole boot camp concept and um, what we did, why we did it, how things worked, what worked, what didn't, uh, things like that. And then um, depending on how long that takes, um, we'll have um, plenty of time for questions. You can ask questions at any point, of, uh, of course, but we'll also have particular time for questions. Um, and then if we have time, we have an activity uh, that, um, that we can do as, uh, as well. Um, so let's uh, start with uh, with introductions. So um, uh, yeah, as Emma said, my name's Claire Bowen. Um, I'm uh, a linguist. I work at Yale. Um, I do a lot of work with language documentation, language reclamation, um, particularly uh, with um, with Australian languages and Australian language communities. Um, and as you can imagine, being in the US working uh, with Australian communities, uh, I've spent a fair amount of time thinking about how to do that in a way that's uh, effective from the other side of the world so you know not trying to do things that um, that are better done locally but still uh, hopefully uh, hopefully being useful um, so let me uh, turn over to um, uh, to Denise and uh, and George um, and shall I switch to the uh, to the other PowerPoint too yes thanks <clears throat> Very too many windows. 
is open. There we go, that one. And then okay. Um, I'm just trying to come down. Did you want to come to my uh, talk on your uh, PowerPoint? Oh yeah, to the to the welcome. Yeah, uh, no, the next one down after that. Sorry, yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. um, hello, everyone. My name is Denise Smith Ali, and I'm a Nyunga woman from the southwest region of Western Australia. Um, and you, if you want to have a little quick read, you can see that, but I'll do a little quick abbreviation on it. Um, so I was born down south in my father's country and we were part of the Biliac, the, the, the river people. And um, I work now with the, the Noongar Borja Language Centre and I've been uh, with them for about five years, but I've worked on my own language for about uh, 21 years. Um, and I'm a senior linguist working with the Nyungar Borja Language Centre um, and I'm looking at all the historical and the forensic analysis of Nyungar language uh, and drawing up um, a database, working on a lot of dictionary work and also sketch grammars and the phonology for Nyungar. Um, so the next one will be George. Hiya, Nanjapuro, George Hayden. Uh, as you can see, you see the little red dot on my map there. That's my mother's country. So I'm a Naji Naji Marmon from uh, the eastern Wheat Belt region. Uh, next door is Balalong. That's my dad's country. So we've got connection to Balalong plus Naji Naji. So um, yeah, I've been with the Language Centre probably just on uh, a bit over a year and a bit now as, as the manager. But previously, before that, I was a chairperson of the organisation. So being the chair and being the manager is totally two different roles. And I'm actually thoroughly enjoying being the manager of the Language Centre. Uh, I get to go out and do things that I wouldn't do as the chairperson. So I go out on country, uh, meet the traditional owners from different parts of the country where we, we go and do work on. Um, yeah, I was... I've been an associate lecturer at Curtin University for over five years. Uh, as you can see, I've got a Bachelor of Applied Science in, in Indigenous Community Health. Uh, I'm also recognised as an elder for the Moongar Nation uh, with my own family, plus right across the board, uh, both in our non-Aboriginal society as well as our Noongar community. Um, yep, I mean... Like I said, I've been trying to break down the barriers for the last 20, 30 years between uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. That's my role that I've been doing uh, through previous works that I've done. So I enjoy it and I enjoy teaching non-Aboriginal people about my culture. And I tell them if you want to learn, you know, don't walk in front of me, don't walk behind me, walk side by side with me and you'll learn and I'll learn from you and you'll learn from me. So... Just on that, I'm going to do a traditional welcome, seeing that we're here down in down under on Noongar country. Kaya Wanju, Nicha, Wajak Noongar Buja, Noongar Jinnanen. Hello, welcome. This is Wajak Noongar country you are seeing. Nalong, Kurt, Jirup Jirup, Nicha Jinnanen. Pa, Ni, we're Karajan, Noongar language. Our heart is happy to see you and listening and learning about our Noongar Wankani. Nala, Karish Nalong, Eriga, we're Bria, Kura Kura Wayi. We acknowledge our ancestors and elders from long ago and until today. Murich uh, Kerala, good morning. Wanju, Muns, Baal, Jukians, welcome, brothers and sisters. Nanjurpan, Wanju, Nunok, Nala, Nunga, Buja. I'm pleased to welcome you to our Nunga country. Nichanala, Muts, Buja, Kura Kura. This is our ancestors' land from the dreaming. Nichanala, Kala, Buja, Kura, Wonkani, Nanjanala, Jurpin, Murt. Nala Buja. This is our homeland of history, and as one, we are proud peoples of our land. Kura Wonkin in Kerala, Nala, Yaking Nala Nunga Ba Wajala. Through history till today, we stand together, 
black and white. Nala, Nala Kekain, we are, we are one. Man pun and respect, Nichabao Wajak Briya, Guru, Yeyi, Baumila. We pay our respects to the Wajak elders, past, present, and also the future. Jinan, Nih Kajan, Jurupan, Nichawirin, Nunga Buja, Nala Maya Maya Buddha. So look, listen, understand, and embrace all the elements of Nunga Buja. This is forever our home. Nala Kadich, Wajak, Nunga Muts, Nichabuja, Kura Kura, Uakadaku, Wajak, Nunga Buja. We acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people and we acknowledge this country always has and forever will be Wajak Noongar country. Nala, Kalich, Balaban, Murut, Jiralak, We, Kungla, We, Boyalak, Nietzsche, Kalich, Dillon, Kep, Boyak, Wool, Baal, Wool. We acknowledge their families to the north, the east and the south and recognise their continuing connection to the land, the waters and the sky. Nalakarich Nalam Dedigur, we're Bria, Kura Kura, we're Yehi Nichimila. We pay our respects to our ancestors and elders of the past and the present and also our future. Balak Ni Jinan, we're Nalak Karajit, Nichim Nalak Nedigar, Jinan Mut Nalak Buja. They are listening, they are looking, they are observing, and we are learning from our ancestors. So we take care of our country where we're on. So welcome to our little talk and we'll start to do our little talk a bit later on. Uh, thank you. So, oh, thank you. So Sue, introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Sue Hanson. I'm the Senior Linguist at the Goldfields Aboriginal Language Centre. And where you can see on George's map there, or the yellow part, um, to the... Uh, East is the area I'm, I work in. So we run an Aboriginal language centre in Western Australia and there are 12 languages. Really, there's 12 First Nations in the region that we're in. Uh, and the Aboriginal language centre, there's only three of us staff here and about nine casual people. There's two linguists. And so the two of us are responsible to work with the 12 languages um, of the area. And I can see Kathy Bowe's name there. So hello to Kathy Bowe. And I look forward to uh, um, this, the session today. Thanks, Claire. Oh, thanks. Um, I just thought, uh, given that we're a pretty small group, maybe everyone could type in uh, just where they where they are at the moment in the uh, in the chat, and um, we'll uh, yeah see uh, see where where everyone is from. Oh, one more thing. Sorry, Claire. I, we're Aussies, so we use Australian, uh, stand Australian English or Australian speak sometimes. So if we say something you don't understand, just type a message to us and we'll clarify. Yeah. Wow. It's wonderful to see um, people from you know, all over the US and Canada, um, uh, Alaska, Hawaii, um, and um, uh, Australia, Papua New Guinea um, as well. So uh, thank you for, for coming to the uh, to the talk um, or the to, to the workshop. Um, we are going to um, so there's um, uh, you found the the, the chat. Um, that's uh, one way to ask questions. You're also very welcome to raise your hand, like the electronic hand, um, uh, at any point, and um, and we can take uh, take questions as um, as well. Uh, so I'm going to go back to um, the other slideshow uh, now and switching between. Right, that one. Um, 
And uh, just for, for those of you who joined us um, just recently, our plan is to um, talk a bit about the boot camps uh, as we ran them. So, you know, what, what on earth is a boot camp? Like, what are we talking about? Um, and how things ran. And um, then some reflections on, you know, what worked, what didn't, and um, how we would do things differently uh, in the future. Um, we have uh, two case studies here, one for um, the Ngalia language um, and one for, um, for Nunga. And um, so we'll talk a bit about the uh, like uh, the, the work that um, and how these things have uh, have worked. Um, we'll have plenty of time for questions both throughout the uh, the session and um, uh, and then also a dedicated question time. And if we have time, we'll uh, we'll do a uh, a workshop activity where we uh, we'd like you to think about the types of materials that uh, that you work with um, uh, in uh, your languages and communities that um, that, that you represent or um, uh, or work with and whether this uh, this sort of project might be uh, might be feasible okay so um, without further ado let's um, uh, talk a bit about um, some of the uh, just the, the boot camp run so you know what is a what is a grammar boot camp what do we mean by that and uh, and how did it work? Um, so basically, we called it um, a grammar boot camp where we had several undergraduate um, college students in the US working uh, together um, with each other and, uh, and with me as a professor, working on um, field notes and uh, texts and audio files pretty intensively. Um, uh, so mostly with, uh, with, with Sue's field notes, um, with regular consultation back and forth between um, linguists, community members, and uh, and so forth, to um, write a sketch grammar and make other materials as um, uh, as needed by um, by the uh, communities and as agreed uh, in uh, in advance. So the sorts of things that were within the scope of the students' abilities and uh, which would be most useful for uh, for communities for um, for the the language center programs. Um, and why did we call it a boot camp? Um, because we did all of this in a month. So basically, it's writing a book in a uh, in a month uh, with a very focused set of um, of activities and uh, and exercises for the uh, for the students. So I think we were I can I think pretty safely say that we were all pretty tired by the uh, by the end of the uh, the project. But um, yeah, so it's basically an intensive four week period to work as much as possible on. A set of materials to bring um, field notes to a stage where they can be used as, um, as sketch grammars um, to um, do tangible work on um, on dictionary files and um, basically whatever else is um, most useful but can be done by um, by people working remotely. So this was uh, this was pre-pandemic, but it was um, uh, a, a sort of remote um, uh, set of uh, so if, you know, we had the students in the in the US. New Haven, and um, uh, and we worked with uh, with a number of uh, communities through the Goldfields Language Center and um, and Nunga Buja um, uh, Language Center as uh, as well. Um, Sue, do you want to say a little bit about the um, the maps? So I, I've got your your two maps uh, here. So. Oh, you got to unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For people who may not be aware, in Australia there are hundreds of uh, traditional languages, Indigenous languages or First Nations. This is Western Australia, where we are, um, and there are around about 85 languages in, in Western Australia. Many of them are severely understudied. Um, we, for example, until about 10 years ago, the, the 12 languages of the Goldfields region, only two of them had even uh, had dictionaries produced. So we're still working very much to record languages as quick as possible with uh, speakers and in many language, partial speakers. Um, and some languages such as um, Denise and George and a couple of other languages, we're recovering old material to recover the languages. So even since we did this map a number of years ago, we've clarified a few more of the languages but there are many, many languages and, and those languages have anything up to five dialects as well. This is the Goldfields region, specifically where I am, and there's two families of languages, the Mirning, and even since we've done that, we've determined that it's spelt M-I-R-N-I-N-Y because we're, we're under study with those languages at the moment, and the Wadi languages. 
And the Wadi languages have all got a, a, a similarity and they're called Western Desert languages, so they're mutually intelligible. But um, they're, they're severely, other than Nganadara and Pichinjara, they were all severely understudied, which is why we worked with Claire and the Yale group. And I'll talk more about that uh, shortly. Thanks, Claire. Oh, thanks. So, um, yeah, so this uh, boot camp set of um, projects started in 2014 um, and I, I just counted up and um, uh, so over the, uh, we basically worked over a five year period in uh, in slightly different ways, but with the boot camp model for um, 2015, 16 and 17, um, we ran the first um, uh, work with um, uh, with Chupan in a slightly different way. It was spread out a little bit more rather than the really uh, focused um, uh, one month. We did it over the um, uh, the spring semester of the uh, of the academic year. Um, but um, and this map shows the uh, the languages that um, that have been involved with um, with, with boot camps over the uh, over that time. So Chupan, Nalia, um, Kandiliwanka, Guara. Nunga and um, and Wankata as well, which was a field methods uh, class, but the the same general sort of setup with the aim of uh, of writing a uh, writing a sketch grammar and um, uh, and so on. So um, I now have a couple of photos of um, some of the participants of uh, of different boot camps over the uh, over the years. Um, so um, uh, Geraldine Hogarth and Luxi Hogarth Redman um, were um, uh, Guara uh, uh, traditional knowledge keepers and elders, um, and um, and so we were able to uh, to work with um, uh, work with them over the uh, what we tried Facebook. Uh, uh, we, we had some uh, connection problems, like this was pre uh, pre too much Zoom, so we ended up on uh, you know Facebook Messenger and um, and uh, Skype wasn't working and uh, and things like uh, things like that but um uh so um yeah so in 2016 uh we uh, uh worked on uh guada um sketch grammar and uh and dictionary um this is the yale team from 2015 um uh for um for Nalia. um so um so the uh, students um and i um sasha and ryan um hannah haney was a, a postdoc uh, at the time and so she helped out with the supervision and um my small person who is now um uh, six years old and considerably larger than that also helped out with uh supervision and you know crawling around the floor and uh and so on eating the telephone uh wires and so on in the lab at various points as uh, as well um, and um, uh, in um, uh, 2014 Andy Jiang who is um, now a graduating grad uh, graduate student in our program uh, spent some time visiting the the Goldfields language uh, language center and worked with um, with Sue and also with Kato Muir um, let me maybe say a little bit about the boot camp origins as uh, as well. And um, Denise and Sue, please um, uh, jump in at any point for um, uh, if I miss things or get things wrong and uh, and so on. So um, the the boot camp started as a um, a collaboration between um, uh, between Sue and uh, and me, with Sue working uh, in uh, language centres in uh, in Western Australia, and uh, you know me looking for um, basically a combination of documentation experiences for students in the US um, and also ways to um, uh, to work appropriately with uh, with language centers and with communities at a uh, at a distance so I, I've been working with uh, Bardi people in Northwest Australia for many many years like 22 23 years now um, but um, but you know that's just one uh, one set of connections um, and so we were thinking about things like how to give students experiences in um, working with real language data not just uh, you know the problem sets that we might construct um, how to train students in ethics and other aspects of field work um, without putting them on the ground and sending them to uh, to the other side of the uh, the world um, and also converse um, I think I have a slide about this a little bit later on. Um, what sort of things can linguists working in this sort of framework be um, most useful for with um, uh, with language centers? So, of course, language centers um, do many, many different things. I'm in awe of um, the, the way that language centers work from in so many different directions, from language, uh, you know, primary language documentation um, to uh, uh -huh. language support, language revival, language policy, um, uh, education in the local school running the local radio show um, uh, working with other groups in uh, in the uh, in, in the, the centers um, and, um, uh, and pizza 
Do whatever you want. So I think someone might need to mute. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so the the uh, yeah, huge huge sorts of uh, many many different uh, sorts of uh, sorts of things. Um, and so so we were looking for ways to um, take take some of the like spread some of the work a bit in ways that um, so you know we in the the US can't uh, you know can't help with running the local radio show but we can do things like formatting grammars and uh, and dictionaries and uh, and things like this um, so this um, boot camp was run as a um, uh, as uh, what's called a, an REU project, a research experience for undergraduates uh, project funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, and this is a project that uh, this is a long long running uh, thing that the, the National Science Foundation has to uh, fund different undergraduate research opportunities. Um, unfortunately, it's restricted to US citizens and permanent residents as uh, as such. So the, the students who participate are college undergraduates. Um, for, for this program, they were juniors and seniors or seniors who had just graduated because we did it over the, uh, over the summer. So they graduated and then uh, did this in the time between going to, um, uh, to, to graduate, uh, starting in, in graduate programs. Um, and um, I have put a, um, a but I uh, while well, in, in a little bit I will put the link in the chat to a Google Drive form, uh, a Google Drive which uh, folder which has things like the application for the um, the REU um, thing to the NSF, which gives you more information about how we set things up. Um, there's also a copy of these slides and um, various other um, other documents which uh, might be helpful for the uh, for the workshop as uh, as well. Um, so the budget that we we had for the RAU program, it was pretty like as NSF budgets go, it was pretty uh, pretty small. So it covered travel for the students to New Haven. Um, it covered a stipend for the students, um, and that was basically uh, basically it. And um, if I remember right, the um, uh, consultant um, time uh, was uh, covered by the Goldfield Language Center as uh, as part of their their regular regular work for um, uh, for for that. So it really was a fairly um, like it was a, a smallish uh, set of uh, set of funds for that. Um, so you might be wondering why write a grammar in a month? Um, so of all the things that we could do, why uh, why do something uh, like this? And I think there are a couple of a uh, couple of reasons for um, for this that um, benefit um, communities, linguists, and linguistics, um, and the students as uh, as well. Um, so partly from uh, for the uh, benefits to communities, these are projects that um, uh, have already been begun, uh, have already been have been worked on to some extent, but um, they're materials that are less available than they uh, they could be because you know as I mentioned, the um, uh, there there are many many things that language centers do, and uh, so the the kind of field thing and the typing up uh, the the materials and working on those materials, particularly um, as you've heard for Goldfield fields where um, there are what uh, uh, 12 languages in the in the region um, that uh, you know that's a like even one language is a huge amount to uh, to work on so having um, uh, so you know multiply that by by 12 so having some uh, having students who can make these materials more available is uh, is useful in furthering the goals set by the the language centers um, it also makes the materials easier to use um, as they're already collected so for instance going from field notes directly to pedagogical lessons is pretty tricky. There's a lot of intermediate sort of processing that needs to happen or um, like working out examples and things like that. But if all of that material is already collected in a sketch grammar with lots of examples and uh, lots of explanation, that makes it easier to plan the lessons from the, uh, from the, the, the grammar. So, you know, a, a sketch grammar is not a, uh, is not a lesson plan. It's not a, uh, not a tool for pedagogy directly, but it's, uh, it's something that feeds into uh, to that. Um, I've mentioned how language centers are busy places uh, already. Um, Sue, do you want to talk a bit about the um, uh, like the the uh, having interest in language from people working overseas and like how that's uh, that's worked in in the community? Sure. So the, the basically the reason we did this because you would say, well, why in a country like Australia did we turn to the US uh, to Yale and Claire? The, the thing in Western Australia is there are very few linguists. There's only a, a handful of us and uh, there's a great deal, a, a huge number of languages 
and many of the language speakers are very elderly. Um, uh, one of the languages we work with in the gold fields, we have a, the, the last speaker who's 84. So we can't spend years just sitting around trying to uh, write a grammar. We have to do it really fast and we have to get material uh, made so that those speakers can teach the languages to their family members really quickly. The other thing is that us linguists are very isolated. So there's two of us in the whole of the gold fields that we're aware of and we get very isolated. It's really cr critical that we work with other linguists and make sure that our what we're doing is uh, correct and comparable and we keep up our own academic development. Um, the other, the last thing is that um, uh, the speakers don't want to um, spend years making things happen. They want to see things happen quickly uh, because the speakers themselves are extraordinarily busy. People may not be aware in Western Australia, Aboriginal people, Indigenous people have to prove their connection to their land and get something called native title. So the speakers are very busy trying to prove their connection to their land and language work as a consequence has been pushed to the side. Uh, but we need to make sure that we keep it at the forefront. And one of the ways to do that is to do things really briskly and quickly and get on with it so the speakers can focus in on native title. So I hope that helps. Well, Denise, did you want to add anything to, um, to that? Um, I think um, our biggest struggle was, um, like Sue said, not having um, other linguists to feed off um, and look at how the, the grammatical structure has changed and looking at the synchronic and diachronic of, you know, how it has left the traditional um, concept into, you know, today's lang language and also the... Um, the urgency of elders passing, but the major request of, you know, elders saying, what was our language like before, the traditional language? So, but the the links of not having um, support of other linguists helping us and, and uh, you know, having Sue in the goldfields and, and now working with you, Claire, and building that strong network and partnership has also been a bonus for us to move forward. So we have, um, so you've heard a bit about the, um, like the reasons to do this from, uh, from a, a community point of view. For linguistics, um, I'd say the, you know, many of the reasons to run a boot camp are the reasons we do language documentation more generally. Um, it's a chance to learn more about the languages of the world, a chance to have a, um, a more accurate um, view of, um, of how languages work, a chance to make sure that our theories of um, how languages work are not just based on uh, you know, languages that are very well documented and, uh, and so on. Um, I'd say for linguistics as well, um, being able to think about ethics and think about um, how to work appropriately with communities and like really, really building that in from the beginning of the uh, of the project is also very important and something that we should uh, you know should be thinking about as uh, as linguists all the time um, and also training future linguists in real documentation no matter what they uh, they end up doing um, as uh, as well so training students for um, working uh, with materials of this type and looking at how the um, uh, how the uh, how the data that they work on as uh, as theoretical linguists might um, might might have originated, um, and that brings me to um, some of the work for for students. So um, this is of course an intense training and research experience for um, for students. Um, there are I think more of these now, but when we uh, we were getting started, there weren't very many of these sort of like really um, uh, intensive paid. Um, summer sorts of uh, sorts of things where they where they got to work in uh, in, in a lot of uh, a lot of detail. Um, of course, having a book, uh, either publication or um, a completed resource on a CV when applying for graduate school does not harm um, at all. It, you know, it's a, that's you know a help um, as um, as well. They of course have the experience of 
working of you know, all all the research that they've uh, that, that they've done. So they have to uh, work. Uh, they have to write very quickly if they're writing a grammar in a month. Um, uh, what 150? Uh, I forget how long the Nungar sketch uh, was. It was like 180 pages or so in um, uh, in a month of uh, of work. So that's a lot of um, a, a lot of writing, and um, so they need to be able to um, uh, be uh, learn to be confident about. Um, their analyses and how to how to write up what they know and uh, at the same time be on the lookout for what they don't know and uh, and things like that. Um, they also get a chance to learn firsthand about ethics and language partnerships as uh, as well. Um, this might be a good point to um, ask if there are any questions. Um, you can either type question in the chat or type the the full question in the chat or um, uh, or raise your hand and um, and we can ask. Uh, yeah, we can take a break for for questions. While well, people are doing that, Claire, can I mention one more thing? Yeah. One of the uh, benefits that arose that was very unexpected for us was, uh, particularly when we work with the Juban people, is the benefit uh, to that very small, there was only five speakers at the time, we've only got three left now to have passed away, but uh, the Juban people were amazed that people on the other side of the world wanted to learn about their language and work on their language. And then when Andy came visiting uh, to Western Australia, it placed a huge amount of um, status on that language. And previously people had, had thought it was something that they should just let go. But it was a, a massive impact on the community, that language speaking community, that people around the world uh, um, shared their interest in their language. And that was really something we hadn't anticipated, but was very positive. Cool. Uh, so we have uh, two questions. We have a question in the chat from Alex um, Walker. Um, so is the lack of linguists in WA due, due to, to lack, lack of available, available, uh, available scholars, scholars or lack, lack of funding? funding? There's, a, there's only one university at the moment that runs uh, linguistics um, undergraduate degree. Um, but uh, there sort of seems to be um, not many people around who just want to do it. There's, there's not much money in uh, linguistics in Western Australia. Unfortunately, our state government doesn't recognise the Aboriginal language as a Western Australia. Consequently, there's not much postgraduate, there's no, well, very little postgraduate uh, programs and funds around. So the only real jobs people can do are working in the language centres, which are run as NGOs. Um, so yeah, it's it's an all round. It's a it's a huge big issue, starting with the fact that the the, the government don't recognise the languages of Western Australia yet. Um, Amanda uh, Delgado has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm really excited about your work. <laughs> it's like oh my god. So I I think I have two questions actually. Um, it's uh, First, if actually the, the, is these sketch grammars have any cultural aspects also um, integrated in, the, in this, this sketch grammar? And then the second question, if it is yes, how actually you gather that type of data in this short time? And I mean, I think most, most of the time, even in the field method class, we're uh, used to, um, to be trained to gather linguistic data, but not the ethnographical data. So I'm interested in um, your uh, work in that sense. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so we um, we worked from uh, from Sue's field notes and from dictionary examples. Um, and so, of course, dictionary examples include um, information about um, day-to-day uh, -day life, um, things that are in the environment, and uh, and so on. Um, for for Noongar, the materials were, were older, so um, there were more um, uh, the uh, there were uh, there were a lot more single word. Uh, word lists um, that, um, that that we were working with. Um, and so so there was uh, so we did not do um, a sort of um, 
uh, simultaneous language and culture documentation uh, that um, uh, that that some projects uh, do, um, but um, uh, but that that information was there in uh, well, so some of that information was there in the uh, in the uh, the materials we were working with, but we were concentrating mostly on the uh, I'd say for for the most part on the the linguistic structures and uh, and so on. And I think that's one area where working at a distance um, there would be many layers of interpretation that we would be um, like putting putting onto that and you know we are able to interpret um, you know what is a locative case marker and and so on but um, but it uh, it would have felt a bit like telling people on country um, Aboriginal people on country how uh, like how they do things and you know they, they know that <laughs> um, so um, yeah so we focus more on the linguistic side of things. So I'll probably answer a bit more as well. So what we tried to do for a couple of months beforehand is I just collected all the data I could everywhere. We've got old documents, historical records, literally copy scanned my field notes, old recordings and our lexical databases that we've done under the toolbox program and put all of that together and handed it over to Claire. And that was one of the th first things the students had to do was then sort through all that material to see uh, what was usable. I just made sure that what we did send was the genuine, was the language, and I'd done a lot of work on making sure it was really clean data to hand over to the students. They didn't have the time to go through and verify the data. It was really important that I handed over very clean data. But aside from historical records and the lexical database, they really needed some good recordings as well so that they could hear the language. Uh, because in some instances, they had to really start from the phonology or phonological aspect and work through. And the the data, um, uh, so your field notes are absolutely awesome. Um, they they're lovely to uh, to work with, and uh, the the way they were organised really made this whole um, this whole thing possible. It would not have been possible with, um, I'd say, most of the field collections that um, that, that I've seen from uh, uh, in in the course of, um, of you know being a linguist for a while. I've worked with a wide variety of data, and um, uh, and the things you've worked with are um, you know, very very easy to drop students in the deep end um, for as, uh, as well. Um, I'm going to take Joyce's question and then I think we might um, uh, talk in more detail about what um, the uh, the procedures were so moving to our um, our case studies um, and uh, I think we might do the uh, the, um, uh, the Noongar case study first and then uh, then I can talk a bit about Nalia for um, uh, for that so I'll answer this question and then switch uh, switch sides uh, back um, yeah so um, in terms of travel and so on so um, uh, the the sequence was um, so Andy was one of the students who did the first um, uh, Chupan uh, boot camp over the course of a semester. And as part of doing that, he um, uh, got very interested in, um, in uh, field work and, uh, and the possibilities of being able to work more on, um, uh, on field linguistics. And so he was able to get a summer fellowship to, um, uh, to travel to the gold fields and, um, uh, and spend some time at the language center. Uh, all of the other work was travel from various parts of the US to New Haven. Um, so everything else was long distance and uh, the time difference was substantial. <laughs> um, it's like 13, uh, 13 hours. So at the moment it's uh, what, just after 10 past 10 um, p.m. here and uh, it's what, 11 a.m. Uh, in um, uh, yeah, in Western Australia, um, and it, it changes a bit with the uh, with the, the time differences and so on. So it's I, I think it's I think it's eleven or twelve hours when uh, we go into daylight saving time in a couple of weeks. But um, uh, it was yes and no. It was something of a, an issue. So it meant that um, we um, we did evening when we um, when we had Skype sessions and so on. It was mostly in the uh, fairly late evenings, um, and you know we started a bit later the next day. Um, but in other ways that. Um, because we weren't trying to do large amounts of online time, I think it worked reasonably, uh, reasonably well. That is the, if the time difference had been different, if we had been closer, we would have done things differently, but given what we, uh, given the way we, uh, we've worked it, 
you know, the fact that it was 12 or 13 hours, not 17 hours, didn't make that much of a, uh, that much of a difference. Um, one thing we've found is that if we have questions towards the end of the day, we can ask, we, you know, we can send an email and then by the next morning, that's, you know, most of a, a full work day uh, in the other, uh, on the other side of the world, which can be helpful for these sorts of collaborations. So let me switch to um, the, the last slides again. Okay. Very good. So, Denise, you have, um, do you want to talk about the, the Noongar side of things? Yeah. Um, so, the Noongar Budja Language Centre is based in Perth, in WA, and um, we, when we first started talking about our language, we um, had a lot of requests from old people saying, you know, what was the traditional language? And I'm a young speaker of my language also. So um, we decided to look at what was the traditional language like. Um, but back in the 70s, the old people started to work on language and they decided that they would go to um, the Noongar language closer to where their time was. So it was more targeted on the contemporary side of looking at um language closer to English, where they could understand that. And they wanted to make books and resources to put into schools. So the traditional language really got forgotten about. And um, so our job really now is looking at the collection data, the management data of who worked on our language, um, the traditional language, and then what was collected. Um, so I'm just trying to get George to open up the data. So a part of doing our language was to look at who had something to do, a uh, written form of um, writing the language and had some contact with my people. And what did they do? Was it a word list or was it just um, some form of uh, talking to the people and documentation? of, you know, Word documents. So we came up with about um, 47 uh, historical data from um, the 19, uh, early, uh, late 1700s to the 1900s. Um, and then we made it, you know, from the, the, the clean data from up to the 1900s when things changed with the, um, you know, with... Um, the change of our language where we couldn't speak language anymore. So there was a lot of evidence there, but it wasn't used. And if it was used, uh, the old people didn't really uh, use a lot of that language because a lot of elders had died from that time. So we've actually put a lot of that into the toolbox now. So we've made um, a, um, a synchronic and a diachronic toolbox that will keep and, and that will manage um, doing dictionaries. Um, so that's where we put everything into, um, but it's not um, really given back to the people. We're still sifting through a lot of that data management. And the boot camp with what you've done, Claire, um, the evidence that was sent across was um, a lot of that collection management. But talking about um, the... Uh, some of the uh, evidence that we had by Noongar people, which was very clean data, there was a lot of politics around using that. So we couldn't really, um, from our perspective, use that material. So it's still closed uh, a special collection and it's still kept on the side for when we need to use it. But um, 
But the Mono people of today are using this contemporized language. And in due time, we will introduce from the data that we collected and put into a dictionary, that'll be the three major dialects, and it's one single language. Um, very ongoing process. Okay, so yeah. I don't know if you have the map um, yeah. of yeah. our um, PowerPoint 8, that one there. So that PowerPoint, you've got the three major dialects. So the light green is the northern dialect. And then you've got this, uh, the orange bit, which is the southeastern dialect. And then you've got the, the blue one, which is the southwestern dialect. So the, the language centre covers every clan and it's one single language. So the grammatical structure is the same. Um, but we're still working through the processes of um, defining um, the, the massive changes that have happened. But the, the, the highly um, endangered one right at the moment is the Amagu people, um, which is our next on our priority list to work through, because um, the neighbouring languages are sifting, uh, are slowly coming into that. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> so um, you've got a couple of slides about the database and so on. Should we should we show yeah. that or should we? Yes, if you want to. Yeah. So. That's the boot camp. Um, we went up to Kalgoorlie and did um, a cultural exchange looking at minimal pairs, working on the phonology. Um, so that's a really good, strong partnership that we had with um, the with Sue and her team in the goldfields. So the, the strong networking of sitting down, looking at the grammatical structure to the Nyunga, to the Nyunga language was um, a bonus that we could travel to her country and have that networking so sifting through the minimal pairs on trying to figure out the phonology on that you know with the guidance from sue Next one. so you can see that this is a collection management that we set up um, so it's about the source um, it's about what dialect it came from uh, what kind of form was it is it was in a spreadsheet or was it videos or audios or something that we had? Um, and then who was it that, you know, who deposited that? Um, if you go to the next one, George. So if you go to the next slide. So it was the, the person who, did, uh, who deposited it and was it put into the toolbox, what kind of transcription and everything it had. So that was a very clear database that we could set up to, for us to keep a close tracking on it. When we first started it, it wasn't as big as this. Um, but, I mean, and this is quite new to the language and it's quite new for our people when we need to talk to them about all this. Um, but it's a good uh, database collection, um, you know, and then we try to do, once we get the audios back from universities or libraries or wherever we find them, we do also do a repatriation back to the families if there's an audio um, and let them know what their great-grandfathers uh, were talking about and who they were and also give them images just to keep the families informed of what we're doing at the Language Centre. Um, and on the next slide, um, so you can see the part of the work that we had to do. We had to look at the three major dialects and a general uh, um, a, you know, just a general dictionary um, for the people to have a really good understanding when we talk about how we're going to do this work, you know. So, yeah. And then in the, in the toolbox, you'll see that we've got, um, you know, a wonderful guidance from Sue of how we do all this. Um, so you look at the old word, the new words, the orthography that they're using today. So we demonstrate that, how that shows, how that's changed, so the synchronic and diachronic and the glossing, the um, everything that we find, we will put that into a field and, please, and keep a close um, 
management on that. Um, what else was there? So I think really that's about where we are. This might be a good point to um, uh, to ask if there are questions um, about the Nunga portion uh, of the uh, of the workshop as well for um, uh, for Denise and George. Uh, Brad had a question about um, the student work on uh, enrichment and preparing documentation for archiving. Um, yeah, so in the process of what we um, uh, of what we worked on, we um, did uh, did a fair bit to the dictionary files, example files, and so on, and um, we. Um, Gave uh, we returned all of that to um, uh, to Sue and uh, and Denise at the the end of the month to go in as part of their um, their collection and archiving uh, procedures. Um, they did relatively little with the, the students did relatively little with um, metadata and, uh, and and things like that. So they weren't involved in working directly with archives or uh, or things like that. But you know, we talked about the the sorts of things that needed to be kept track of and. And, uh, and those sorts of uh, those sorts of things. So we worked very much within the structures that uh, that the language centres had um, uh, had had set up. Um, and so our, our aim was to uh, to make sure that we didn't do anything that uh, that might cause problems with um, with that. Are there questions for Denise about the the Noongar project? I will start screen sharing again for uh, the Nalia case study. Okay, so, um, oh, and I meant to actually let me just uh, your thinking about um, uh, questions and things like that. Let me just uh, paste the link for the drive in the chat while. While you're doing that, everybody, that's called a Sturt Desert Pea, which is a, a beautiful flower that's found in West Australian deserts. Okay, so the drive link in the um, uh, in the chat has uh, these slides and uh, some other documents that uh, that I'll refer to as uh, as well. So um, I mentioned uh, that part of the the purpose of the boot camp is to uh, bring students up to speed in thinking about ethics and um, appropriate work with, uh, with with communities. So many of the uh, the students had um, uh, well, basically no one had. Done Done, uh, I don't think anyone had done any uh, sort of direct field work or working directly with um, uh, endangered language communities. Um, and so uh, we felt it was uh, important for them to, um, to realize this is not just say going to the library and looking up French uh, or going to the uh, going to the uh, the internet and seeing what you can find and so on. Um, and so we had an ethics agreement that um, that Sue put together um, and I, I actually put a slightly redacted copy in the uh, in the Google Docs just saying, this is uh, this is the agreement for um, for what's uh, what's going to happen to the materials. Who's going to work with what? Um, what the students can um, do with the materials afterwards, for instance. Um, so uh, just to make sure that everyone was on the same page for the start about what was uh, what was expected. So, for instance, um, the students um, uh, were expected to um, uh, treat the uh, treat the data with care and respect, and um, to ask if they wanted to use use the um, uh, any sentences for any projects later on or, um, uh, or or things like that and we felt that was very important because um, uh, because we were already working at some remove from uh, from language speakers and um, uh, you know it's important that the uh, the language communities know what's happening to the data um, you know it's a um, it's a you know, I, th I think it's a big thing to send these uh, send this sort of um, language material to the other side of the world it's a you know a, a vote of trust for um, 
um, for us because you know we haven't we haven't met in person and so on. It's not a, not the usual way of working uh, working with things, particularly at the start. Um, and so it's uh, it's important from uh, the uh, the linguist side to make sure we don't do anything that would um, uh, that that would uh, you know not not live up live up to that trust. Um, so the yeah so we we worked through the ethics agreement and um, uh, and that kind of set the uh, set, set the stage for uh, for this and students were very much encouraged to ask um, uh, any questions about uh, procedures and protocols um, and um, to to see how how things might work over the over the course of the uh, the month. Um, so in terms of the background materials for, um, for Ngalia, um, we had um, the Ngalia field notes and sketch grammars. We also um, looked at grammars of other languages and the general linguistics literature. Um, so Western desert languages, um, uh, Wadi languages have a, uh, there are some, uh, some varieties which are quite well described and have um, a fair amount of primary literature. Um, and there are others uh, that have, uh, have very little um, and so we were able to uh, work with the primary literature that was available. Um, so the grammars of Bindubi uh, literature, or the Nanatara grammar, um, and um, uh, the uh, and Kundatara uh, grammar, um, and see what sorts of um, what sorts of structures, what sorts of grammatical structures words and so on are common to uh, different body varieties and uh, what items vary. Um, and as you might expect from uh, a, a very large, very um, uh, dialectally diverse lang uh, language language subgroup, there's um, a fair amount of similarity, but there's also a lot of difference. Um, and so um, when we were working with these materials, we wanted to make sure that we were not just you know, trying to transfer items from one um, variety to another, we were using the other materials as a way to um, to see what sorts of things we should be looking at, say for Ngalia, um, but not to say, oh well, Bindubi has this, so Ngalia must have this as uh, as well, because that's that's not how it works for uh, for these varieties. Um, so for Melia, um, there was a, a sketch grammar that um, that Sue and Cato had put together in uh, in 2014, um, uh, which was about um, 30 uh, 30 pages, if I remember right. And so our job, uh, like our task for the uh, the boot camp, was basically to expand that uh, that sketch grammar and to add to the dictionary and um, generally, I guess, make ourselves useful for um, uh, for this sort of thing. So we had a um, uh, a set of texts, um, a set of um, uh, sentences from example sentences from the dictionary and I'll, I'll show you an example in a uh, just a sec um, and there were more than a thousand of those uh, those sentences and uh, in the short learners guide um, and so we um, uh, our aim was to do things like for instance with the dictionary um, match the dictionary examples to um, uh, to the words that were in the uh, in the dictionary um, so uh, say for instance so here's a here's an example with um, uh, you know one example of a uh, of a, a sentence, um, so we have um, this word. Um, uh, so what the no, uh, for example, so uh, tell um, the no uh, ending tells us that this belongs to a particular conjugation. We want to make sure that the entry for um, uh, for tell is. Um, uh, you know, tells us that uh, that this is that conjugation. So we were doing a lot of that sort of uh, checking. Um, we also here have um, an example of a, um, a reflexive uh, form, so we can add that to the uh, to grammar and talk look for other reflexive examples and uh, and things like that. We have a negation, so we with we are. Um, we have um, one question we were looking at early on was whether um, ngayo is always ngayo or is it ngayo lo, um, whether lo has an independent meaning for the first person because sometimes it does in some uh, in some multi varieties, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and so, you know, all of these all of these sorts of uh, linguistic questions that um, to some extent are ling um, uh, you know grammatical questions for for linguistics, but are also things that. Um, language teachers want to know, um, and uh, particularly where we're working with materials where um, some of the varieties are pretty similar, uh, some are, I'd say, on the whole, less similar than they might first appear. So many of the words are um, uh, cognate; um, they uh, they recur across uh, across varieties, um, but the um, the uh, the grammar is uh, is more different than uh, than we might expect from just just looking at the words. 
Okay, so um, so the way we we worked. Uh, so if we're going to write a grammar in a month, um, we you know we have to we have to do a bit of planning. Um, so the way we did that was not to think about this as writing a grammar in a month. Um, we thought of it as working on a set of small topics with regular small deadlines, daily meetings, a lot of feedback, um, a lot of um, uh, questions about what we could and couldn't answer um, at, um, uh, at any particular point. And um, in the Google Drive, there's a, um, the schedule uh, that, um, that we uh, put together and the, uh, the particular list of topics. And I just summarized it here on the, uh, on the slide. So for, um, this works slightly differently for, um, for different, um, uh, different years, but basically what, what it worked was basically a two, two to three day cycle. Um, so for instance, on Monday morning, um, we uh, come in and think about, okay, what are we going to work on uh, right now? Um, so we'll assign topics. So maybe someone's going to uh, find all the pronouns in the example sentences and put together a chart of all the pronouns. Um, someone else is going to um, look at all the location examples. So look at locatives and allatives and ablatives um, and any other case markers that, um, that, that we can see. Um, and maybe someone else is going to uh, look at numerals or, um, or, or something like that. Um, oh, I guess I never mentioned uh, how many students there were at any one time, but, um, uh, but we had three or four students in, uh, in, each, uh, in each group. So um, there's yeah, so enough people to be able to pass out tasks, but not so many people that, um, that were stepping on each other's feet. Um, and so, okay, so in the morning, we'll assign the topics, we'll talk through, make sure that um, everyone's clear about what they need to do. And then their aim between, say, 10 o'clock Monday morning and three o'clock Monday afternoon is to have a first analysis. So they, um, in that time period, they can pull out examples from the, uh, the toolbox files that we have. Um, they can see what's there and they can start thinking about how to analyze it. Um, and so that afternoon, we'll do a workshop with, uh, with everyone on the analysis and we'll think, okay, so does that, uh, does that uh, fit with what we've seen so far? Do people know example sentences where um, that uh, we might have some different information? It, does that bring up other questions, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and uh, as you can imagine, when we first start, so on Monday of the first day, we have a huge amount of questions. Basically, we have no answers, we have only questions. Um, but by the middle to the end of the second week, we've been working very intensively on the uh, the materials and so we have a much better idea about both what is there um, and also what sort of examples might um, uh, might might be useful and what sort of analyses we're, we're looking at okay so we uh, we would do a preliminary workshop um, on the analysis and then by Tuesday afternoon by by that meeting they would the students would have a draft of that section of the uh, of the grammar so there, there would be like two to three pages of um, uh, of writing up of what they had done over that last uh, the last couple of days um, and then they'd get feedback from me um, and then they would revise it um, after that feedback and then on Wednesday we'd start a new topic again so we worked like this for basically three, yeah, three weeks or so. So the first couple of days was a bit of setup and then, or the first day. So, um, and then we had three solid weeks of, uh, of working along these lines. And then the last couple of days was uh, going back, revising, um, making sure that uh, we were consistent and, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, as part of um, working primarily with the materials, we also were able to um, uh, to to work with um, with language speakers directly, um, as um, as I mentioned, um, and uh, we were also able to ask Sue clarification questions as things came up. And um, so there was uh, we also um, uh, did roughly weekly reports on here's what we've done so far, here's the work in progress. We um, we did a lot of work through Google Docs so that um, uh, so that anyone in the project could have access to. To the uh, to the materials at um, at any time. Um, so in terms of results for um, for Nalia, um, we uh, ended up with a sketch grammar of um, about 130 pages. Um, it covers the topics that you would I say all the all the topics you'd expect in a sketch grammar. So we're not we're not writing 600 page reference grammars, but at the same time we're um, you're covering a, a reasonable set of materials that um, uh, that can feed into uh, into language programs and so on. 
Um, we aimed for lots of examples and clarity, not too much terminology. Of course, some terminology is needed, but we wanted to, uh, to make these documents as useful as possible to as many people as possible. So that includes people looking for examples of how to say locations or examples of numbers, um, as well as people who are looking for how do you say the, um, uh, I don't know, the, um, uh, the future of, uh, of this particular conjugation or how many members are in this uh, of the of verbs that are in this conjugation class. Um, this grammar was accepted for publication by Asia Pacific Linguistics, um, and um, there were a fair number of comments from the review for that, and uh, those comments are being addressed at, um, uh, at the moment. Um, when we talk about the reflections in a little bit, one of the things that I'm going to bring up is the, uh, the on the one hand, um, opportunity of working really solidly on a, on a grammar like this for, for a month and then the difficulty of coming back to it once regular life intervenes um, and all the uh, all the other things that um, uh, that, that go on as um, uh, as well like regular teaching and um, uh, PhD supervision and things like that. Um, so uh, yeah, so part of the um, uh, the Nalia uh, bootcamp was the uh, was the sketch grammar. Um, we also did a lot of work on the Nalia dictionary for things like um, spelling standardization. Um, many um, Wati varieties have slightly different spelling conventions, um, and so um, so we uh, standardized this to the to the Nalia conventions. Um, we made sure all the examples had uh, all the words in all the examples had head words. Uh, we were able to add more examples, um, paradigm information. Um, we edited some of the glosses for, for clarity. So for instance, you know, English has a lot of words which are both um, nouns and verbs. Um, and so you need the part of speech information to, um, to know if, um, uh, I don't know, the word, um, uh, the word spear is a, uh, is a noun or, uh, or a verb or, um, or, or things like that. And just you know, trying, to, trying to make the uh, things as clear as, uh, clear as possible. Um, we also made some language lessons for uh, for Malia based on these materials as a an example of the sorts of things that could uh, could come up. Okay, so um, uh, at that point, this might be a good point to ask for questions about um, any of the any of the material we've talked about so far. Let me have a look at the participants list. Um, Alex. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Can I ask, when you're describing how um, you only put those things that you would expect in a sketch grammar rather than writing a full grammar, um, what do you mean by that? What's, is there a standard source for what would be expected in a sketch grammar, or is it more just you limit it to what you can competently discuss in that number of pages? Um, yeah, it's it's more the latter than the um, the former. There is now a um, template that um, uh, oh, it's the the group that was formerly the Resource Network for Linguistic Diversity. I forget they they've now changed their name. Reynolds' new name, um, Living Languages. Thank you. Um, yeah, Li Living Languages has a um, a sketch grammar template um, now. At um, uh, at that point, uh, we didn't uh, we didn't have that, but um, uh, so I, I think for future boot camps, we would. Uh, we would probably use their um, their grammar template, um, but um, this uh, there's there are quite a few sketch grammars of, um, of uh, indigenous languages in Australia, Aboriginal languages, and um, th so there's a set of topics which are typically included, um, which are both fairly easy to find in uh, the sorts of examples that we have from, uh, say, from the Nalia Dictionary. Um, and uh, so we were able to build on, uh, build on those, sorts of, uh, those sorts of materials. Um, I, uh, in the Google Drive, there's, uh, I put together a list of templates just to, um, to start us off. Um, so these are, these are pretty brief. I keep meaning to go back and update them to make them a bit more, a bit more specific, but they were things like the, the sort of topics that in, um, at minimum, we needed to cover for someone to be able to put a sentence together, together in the, um, in, in the, the language. language. So we need to know something about verbs. We need to know something about nouns. We need to know something about case marking. Um, we need to know something about um, multiple, like how to put clauses together. Um, we need to know something about numerals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, um, 
like how far we go for this was limited in part by the amount of time we had. Um, so we, w one thing we we wanted to do was to make sure we could produce a a finished product in a month. Like we didn't want to do half a half a sketch grammar or you know half a longer grammar um, and say okay, well we got to verbs, but sorry nouns will do some other year because um, like, you need to know the nouns as well. Um, and so we wanted to to have broadish coverage, even if that meant less detail about individual grammatical constructions. Um, and that also suited the um, the material we had with the uh, with the example sentences as um, uh, as well. I think. Um, yeah, so that that's that's kind of how we um, how we worked on things. Like there there is always more to um, always more to see and always more to discuss in a uh, in a grammar. And so we don't think of these as the uh, the last uh, the last word for um, uh, for any of this. Uh, in fact, that might be a good point to um, uh, to move to the. Um, uh, some of the things about reflections and uh, like working back on uh, on things. So I have a couple of things about the uh, the faster like why why aim for a month when maybe with a bit more time we could um, uh, we could do a bit more. Um, I think that like th this is a question I, I've got a couple of times about uh, about this. Um, and then we also have some uh, some time for you know, reflections and further questions as well. Um, so um, I think faster is, of course, not better, um, of course. Um, but the it, when we think about grammar writing and language documentation, um, there's a lot of grammar writing where it's not, even if it takes a long time, it doesn't need to take that um, that amount of time. So, you know, I think about the Bardi uh, grammar um, and the Bardi grammar took um, basically eight years um, from uh, from start to, to finish. It's a it's a large-ish grammar. It's like 700 pages. But, uh, but of course, I wasn't working on that for all of that uh, that time. I had nine months or 10 months in the, um, uh, at one point working with, uh, with community members. But I also wrote a dissertation and um, I, uh, you know, started a teaching job and uh, and, and things like that. So um, the if, if we actually compressed the time into only working on Bharati all day every day, then the time you know it still would have been a, a substantial amount of time. But um, uh, and then I guess if you multiply me by by three because there's uh, you know there were three or four of us working on this, um, then we're starting to get uh, like it's. Um, you know, okay, it's a month, but it's also four person months of people working around, you know, not quite around the clock, but um, but full, uh, but you know, full, pretty full on for uh, for this. Um, we also felt that um, having something that's accessible but with gaps, or um, hopefully not too many errors, but uh, but at least with some gaps, is better than um, saying that this is for the uh, for the future. Um, and this goes back to um, some of the things that Sue was saying earlier about um, the uh, you know we're working with elderly speakers and um, the you know, the. Uh, there's a window in which this sort of material is useful, um, and so we want to make sure it's as useful as possible, as you know, as early as uh, as possible. Um, I think there's also some advantages to um, staying. Um, uh, staying focused and um, being able to work collaboratively and um, catch each other's uh, each other's errors, um, and so we found that when we, as we were working through the materials, we were able to um, you know, remember examples that um, were either confirming or uh, not confirming uh, hypotheses that we we put together, um, and we knew much more um, readily what we needed to uh, to check, um, and so so that sort of Think, like being able to just think about um, Nali or just think about Guada for um, uh, for uh, you know that period of time meant that we probably made fewer errors than um, and were more consistent than we would have been. In fact, we kind of found that with the Chupan grammar uh, from uh, from the first thing where uh, for the, the first boot camp where in the first year we we met every week but we only met once a week um, and we met throughout the semester and uh, we worked in some ways in the same uh, the same way we had a similar amount we had slightly more students um, and we ended up um, you know, writing, a, I think it was 70 or 80 page uh, grammar. But when I came to compile everything and um, uh, to, uh, to uh, give it back to Sue and so on, I spent three weeks, I think, just eliminating inconsistencies because we hadn't worked all day every day. Uh, whereas for Nalia, there were many, many fewer of those because we'd been able to catch them along the, uh, along the road. 
Um, oh, I see Amanda has um, uh, put the link to the um, uh, to the living language uh, template in the uh, in the chat. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the one. Um, Sue, did you want to ask, uh, like, talk about Joyce's question about the uh, about toolbox resources? Sure. So we we used toolbox as a, a lexical database, and it was very useful. We 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 liked that, but it was very useful because it gave the students a good start, uh, morphine by morphine. But it also meant when they discovered more material, they could then put that material into toolbox rather than have to tell me, and then they just handed toolbox back to me at the end. So it became a very useful tool uh, to, to have something that we could share back and forward together. We just had to be really cautious to make sure that we mark them with versions because you end up with a number of versions going back and forward otherwise. But I, I highly recommend Toolbox if you're going to do such a, a thing like this because there's so much data that the students need to share with you and you need some sort of database for them to put all that material into. Right. Yeah. And um, we um, so we we had a number of issues around version control um, for um, for our work amongst ourselves. Uh, we were um, basically all in the same room, so we could say, "Okay, I'm going to edit this uh, this file now." And um, and so that um, uh, that meant that we didn't. Um, uh, we didn't have too many problems when um, once we had a system worked out, but um, but neither Toolbox nor Flex is um, very makes it very easy to have multiple people working on the same files at the same time. Um, so what we ended up doing within the group was to um, working with Toolbox to have a a set of files that only one person could work on at a time. Um, and that was the that was the main version um, where and then we would have um, if anyone wanted to look up something in the database or you know do searches and things like that uh, they would make a copy of those uh, those files and work from the uh, work from their own local copy um, and then they had to remember that they couldn't change anything on those uh, those files um, one of the nice things about toolbox of course is that it, it works on text files and so we can use um, a text editor to compare um, files and um, and just recombine. Uh, if two people made changes, we can just recombine them in the text editor. Um, that's much more difficult to do in uh, in Flex. Um, and so we we did for the one of the um, field methods class, we ended up using Flex, and um, we ended up converting back to Toolbox um, because uh, it was just more easy to do the sorts of things we needed to do with um, with the Toolbox files. So that the additional um, sophistication in terms of parsing or um, uh, you know dictionary customization and things like that just they. Uh, they weren't worth it compared to the flexibility of what we could do with uh, with toolbox. Um, that was also because in most years there was um, at least one of the students had some uh, computational linguistics training um, either with Python or with some other type of um, natural language processing. And so we were able to do things like make a list of all, like pull out all the phonotactic charts for all the consonant clusters and so on very, uh, very easily. That's not something that toolbox does. It's not really something that flex does. Does, but you can do that in three keystrokes from a text file, um, and so so that that sort of thing was quite important. Um, I think now might be a good time to talk about some of the like just reflections about what worked, what didn't. Um, I put a couple of things that um, uh, that I thought for um, for here, but um, but of course there are many other things we could uh, we could talk about as um, uh, as well. So um, so actually one of the things I forgot to put on the slide was the um, the version control um, issues um, and uh, and also getting up to speed with uh, using things like Toolbox and um, and Prat for uh, working with sound files and so on. For the students who had done, uh, who had already worked with these programs, it was uh, a little bit of a learning curve to, to see a new project and so on. But for the most part, they were they were able to, to work pretty seamlessly. For the students who hadn't used those programs before, learning Malia or learning Chupan and also learning Toolbox at the same time was, uh, you know, there, there was a bit of brain overload at, uh, at times for, for that. And, you know, fair, fair enough too, these are complex programs. Um, and so, so I think for the future, we would probably want to separate those two things, even if it meant we uh, either had to make the boot camp a little longer. Um, a big thing was um, the, um, 
for uh, I mentioned this before, following up from the boot camp, it was difficult to continue with the um, the materials um, simply because after we had uh, so you know immediately after the boot camp we were all exhausted <laughs> um, and then uh, the students went off to um, either uh, their next year of college or starting graduate school. Um, uh, you know, I started the next academic year and uh, and so on. And so being able to maintain some sort of continuity with materials um, uh, has been uh, has been difficult. And uh, you know that's something. I need to I, I need to try and figure out like how to, how to build that into the uh, the program and to think about this not uh, you know from my perspective the boot camp is what a month or so but I need to think about it as a month plus uh, you know a bunch of uh, a bunch of other things that uh, that need to happen afterwards. Um, I'd also said that this sort of uh, long distance work like this works for linguisty material so it works for things that. Um, linguists already have some training in grammatical analysis, things like that. Um, it doesn't work so well, or at least I imagine it won't work so well for things which um, uh, other types of uh, materials or support that communities and language centers need for language work, um, most of which external remote linguists either can't provide or really shouldn't try to provide. So, you know, things like running languages, language classes, running, you know, having us run a language class from the other side of the world would, I think, be a disaster. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not the right people to uh, to do it. We don't have the connections to country. Um, uh, and, um, and so, uh, but, you know, even if we can, you know, do some of the technical things around um, uh, around teaching what a you know, what a location marker is and uh, and things like that. So so this is uh, on the one hand a a fairly general sort of setup, but on the other hand uh, we should I think think pretty carefully about what types of projects work well for having external remote people work on uh, work on language materials. Um, and I'd, I'd also say that I think this partnership, at least from, from my perspective, it worked pretty well, um, but because we already knew each other um, and so we weren't trying to build um, relations from, uh, from scratch, um, but if we were trying to build something from, uh, you know, without having, uh, uh, you know, without having common acquaintances and so on, I think that might, that might not have worked so well. Um, so and Denise, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, something else on reflection that worked is, uh, is me being really clear that my job was as a field linguist in this and Claire and the team were the, the uh, grammarians and so I made sure for that month that I could respond to emails really quickly when they had questions or set up Skype sessions or Zoom sessions with the speakers really quickly. So I, I kind of were, was doing the working with the speakers running things past them continuously. And that worked really, really well because it meant um, these guys, could, they could get on with doing it, all the analysis of the material. Uh, but it was really important that I made sure I had that time available to respond immediately to emails and requests for times with the speakers. Uh, yeah, and that ended up working, uh, I think, very seamlessly because we were able to um, work on work on some text, um, come up with some questions, um, ask the questions, get the answers within a day, and then like still have everything very uh, very fresh um, before before moving on and like resolve things before moving on to the uh, the next thing before so before too long. I think we've only got five minutes. Claire, by the look of it. Yeah, no, we've uh, the time has the time has gone quickly. So um, yeah, yeah. two things I don't really want to bring up is can I quickly do them now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So this, um, let me stop the two really important considerations, um, and then we'll quickly get back to your two important considerations if you're thinking of doing this of working with somebody else somewhere to on your language um, or grammar is the first one was copyright intellectual property and intellectual rights and really thrashing that out. And as Claire mentioned, we put it in documents, who owns what? And um, from our perspective, being very clear about what the students could do with their knowledge and the material afterwards. If they wanted to write a paper later on, they needed to uh, put the speakers as co-authors. So whilst they're doing the grammatical and the linguistic material, they also need to acknowledge the speakers. And that was very, really important. Um, so also looking at traditional knowledge and intellectual rights in this material and being really respectful of the speakers. 
uh, because it's a huge ask for Aboriginal people in Australia to send material over to another country and allow people to work on it. So we really had to work that out. We had to have it in documents beforehand. And thinking about ethics, all of the ethics in this, um, the copyright legislation in Australia compared to the copyright legislation in the US may be different. So we had to mesh that all together and come up with some agreed ethics. So if you're going to do this, I think that's two things you really need to thrash out and work out. And Claire and I have both done all of that, so we're very happy to share that if anyone contacts us later. Thanks, Claire. Yeah. So we have a, uh, I think we're basically out of, uh, out of time. Um, Thank you um, to uh, to everyone who's um, who's come to the um, to the session this afternoon. Um, thank you to uh, to Denise and George and uh, and Sue for um, uh, you know for, for just for, for everything. Um, and um, uh, if um, uh, if you have questions from uh, like for, for any of us, you could maybe send us an email. Um, it's eleven p.m., so I'm not going to stay on in the social chat or anything uh, here. We are repeating this workshop. Uh, Tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, my time. Um, so, in I guess about sixteen hours from uh, from now, um, you can check the uh, the schedule for uh, for details. Um, but um, but yeah, thank you for for coming. Thank you for the, the questions. Um, and um, feel free to um, uh, have a look at the Google Drive um, uh, link and uh, and so on. And if you have questions from from that material, please let us know. Um, and yeah, have a good rest of your day or evening or. Um, Thanks, Claire. I'll stay online for a bit longer. Yes. I'll be on there too. Thanks, Claire. Thanks. Yeah, in that case, I think I might go to bed. Um, so I'll see you tomorrow. Um, yeah, so um, I guess it's, what, 6 a.m. for uh, for you tomorrow morning. Um, yes. Yeah, we'll um, be right. Yeah, Monday morning. But, um, yeah. Um, oh, the contact, uh, that's a very good point. Um, I don't think the contact info is in the Google Drive, but I will add it right away. Um, I will, uh, I'll just put a text document in there with our, uh, with our contact information. Um, so yeah, cool. yeah, so see you later. I'll just okay. put, my I'll put my email address here. I'm quite happy to share it now. If anyone has further questions afterwards. Anyone else have any other questions? Um, I, I have one. If that's all right. Yeah. Trying to get my video going here. I, I just want to know a little bit more about when you're saying that Western Australia doesn't recognize the languages. What does that mean? What are what, yeah. what are the ramifications of that? And is it unusual within Australia and so doing? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an historical situation. So some states do now recognise the Aboriginal languages, like there's a state, New South Wales, um, which had a, an Aboriginal languages policy, but now it's legislation. So the languages are recognised um, by the, the state government. We haven't got that situation in Western Australia. So as a consequence, there's no, if there's no legislation, there's no policies, there's no funding or anything to, to work on the language and the preservation and so on. So the language centres in Western Australia, which there's five of us now, we're all reliant on Commonwealth funds and raising funds elsewhere to make sure that the important language preservation work is uh, undertaken. Um, so it, it's a huge issue for us in Australia and it's, a, it's an issue that Australia has to come to terms with. Um, we're hoping, you know, that the country will come to terms with recognising all Indigenous languages. But, um, it, yeah, it's a, it's a long way to go. Um, thank you. Which, where are you from, Alex? I live in Australia now. I'm a permanent resident here in uh, Cairns. I actually live in the oh, suburb of Quarra Beach. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. but I, my, I, I, came here, I came here to work on Papuan languages and PNG and COVID kind of messed everything up. So I don't really have much yeah. knowledge about the situation in mainland Australia proper. So I was very interested yeah. to hear kind of what you were um, going through. I don't know whether Queensland has a policy, state policy, or has it got legislation. I knew New South Wales definitely has legislation now. But 
We have, um, there's around about 12,000 first language speakers in Western Australia. And as a consequence of the language is not being recognised, there's no uh, state funding for interpreting and translating, for example, or for preservation of the languages. So we're really hard up against, uh, and, and it's one of the reasons there's not many linguists here because there's not the funds to work on the languages. And uh, so, so as we said at the Goldfields Language Centre, we've got 12 languages and only two of us linguists. Um, so we, we, we're peddling really hard and fast. Wow. It's a stupid situation. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry to hear it. Very complicated, it sounds as well. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this is where the Yale work with Claire has just been a blessing for me because I can just do all the field work, gather all the data, pass it over to them, then start working on the next language, you know. So I, I really recommend this kind of uh, idea, but also it gave the speakers a huge amount of energy when they realise other people other than just me and the few of us at the language centre were really interested in their language. That was something that was really quite astounding to us. They, they were just amazed that they had thought their languages were not important as well because everybody treats them as that. And so particularly when young um, Andy came across from the US, that just blew everybody's minds and said, these people in the US are really interested in our language. Um, and that was for people who uh, speak a language that's not recognised in the state or acknowledged, that was a really, really important thing. Do you think this is something where um, if there were linguists interested in trying to, to help out, um, it might be worth trying to look for funding, external funding opportunities to try and, and pitch in or? Yeah, well, we, we spend most of our time just trying to keep enough money together to, to, to keep the work going. But we what we do at the uh, Language Centre is we do welcome people to come for internships for two weeks, anything from two to four weeks. Um, and we, we can't really pay anything at all to help people, but uh, we get people to come and work with us for anything from two to four weeks. Um, and then we find if people are really interested in those languages, well, we've had some students come and they've done internships and then have gone back and said, look, I might do a PhD on a grammar on one of the languages. You know, that's what we're trying to do, build up that. Um, so oh, then yeah. they can go attract funds that way. Well, I was just curious in terms of... Uh, uh, so someone, you know, someone who already is, is older, already has a PhD, maybe might be looking to put together an ARC proposal. Yeah. Would there be something like that that might, because one of the, one of the complexities yeah. of doing that is just not having, having connections yet in those communities and not knowing what's allowed or who wants that. Yeah. yeah. So there. That's it, what we say to people, yeah, people come and do the two week internship and explore all that, you know, that's part of exploring it because you're absolutely right. Aboriginal people also say that they are the most researched people in Australia and Denise and uh, George may talk on this and people get tired of being researched. Um, so they get fatigued. So uh, building that relationships before going for fundings is really critical. Denise and George, I don't know if you want to talk on that. Yeah, about I people think being, yeah, about people being studied all the time. Aboriginal people saying they're sick of being studied. Oh yeah, and we they, we always get people saying that you know, oh, we've done this you know ten years ago, or even longer, and it's the same thing going around and around the circle. But in the linguistic arena, it's um, it's quite new, but. It's how do we get there, you know. Um, so I guess looking back at the analysis of our work, even though, you know, we don't, I'm the only Indigenous linguist, you know, quite well around Australia, around WA. Um, so, you know, it's always about how do we get there? How do we move on to that? How do we keep going, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, we are studied all the time. Um, George, did you want to say anything there? Well, I suppose we we were studied since um, first contact. Yeah. It goes back to two hundred odd years. So yeah, you know, at least um, people come off the boats and yeah, want to record the languages and do this and do that with our language. 
um, past policies um, prevented us to practice our language. You know, if you look at the history in the 1905 Act here in West Australia, um, the old fellows weren't allowed to speak language or practice culture. So, you know, that, that went for quite a number of years up until uh, 1967, where they had a big, a big referendum here in Australia where every Indigenous person were classed under the Fisheries and Faunas Act, especially in WA, and after 67, we were classed as, you know, so-called human beings in our own country. Uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of past policies, um, yeah. Yeah, so we're very, very well researched, our people, but, and I suppose all these researchers don't end up anywhere. They end up on, in cupboards and drawers and whatnot and collect dust. You know, people do research and do all this sort of stuff, but nothing happens from it. So, and as, as Sue said, you know, our, our language uh, needs to be highlighted, especially here in West Australia, uh, where it's not, so by the government. Uh, the education department's um, slowly working work on our language. Uh, they, but then again, it's up to the education system, especially the schools, if they want to, you know, want to, I suppose, produce our language in, in the schools. Because there's a, in the school system, there's a, there's a program called Language Other Than English, LOAT. And it's up to the schools to actually run with, with this program. But a lot of the other programs from LOAT, uh, it looks at German, Italian, Malaysian, but they don't look at the local indigenous language. Yeah. Which is a bit so, yeah. We're yeah, about I to am. finish. So it looks like we're finished. All right, lovely to meet you all. Please drop us emails if you've got questions. Yeah. Lovely. See you. Yeah. Emma. Yeah, we'll Thanks, Emma. And you're also welcome to go over to the social lounge if you want to keep talking on Zoom. We just have to close this room. Yeah, no, that's okay. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.